The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the Gospel according to St. Mark, in the first chapter and in verses 14 and 15. Verses 14 and 15 in the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, this is a most momentous statement. After that John was put in prison, that's to say John the Baptist, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, in these words, uh, this uh, particular gospel writer, Mark, gives us at the very outset an epitome, a kind of summary of the whole message that he's going to unfold in his gospel. He's introduced it, he's given us very briefly, as is his characteristic as a writer, certain essential preliminaries. But it's here he really comes to the thing that he wants to talk about. In a sense, he announced it in the first verse by saying, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then he went back and just gave us a little glimpse of the ministry of John the Baptist, who was our Lord's forerunner or herald, the one who came preparing the way for him, calling people to be ready for him and his message, saying that he was nothing but a voice himself, that there was another mightier than he coming after him, one the latchet of whose shoes, he says, I am not worthy to stoop down and then loose. He says, I'm only preliminary. I'm only preparatory. He is about to come. Very well, here Mark tells us, John was cast into prison. He was, he was thrown into prison, you remember, because of his faithful preaching to King Herod, his denunciation of his illicit and illegal marriage arrangements and life and so on, John was thrown into prison. All right. After that, Jesus came into Galilee and he began. His ministry begins. Now then, it's to this I want to call your attention this evening because it is, as I say, such a perfect summary of what Christianity really is, what it stands for, what the message of the gospel really is. And I'm doing this, I think I need scarcely say, because perhaps there is nothing that is so sadly needed in this modern world as just again a simple, direct, and varnished statement as to what the gospel is about. Now, this, this is, as I'm never tired of saying from this pulpit, to me the standing and almost perpetual problem. How does it come to pass with open Bibles before us that men and women should not so much be wrong about certain details with respect to the gospel, but should be wrong about the whole thing, should be wrong about the very essence of the gospel? Now, I say that it's quite understandable that there should be certain points, certain aspects, certain facets of truth about which people are not clear, about which there may be division of opinion, that's all right. We can well understand that because this gospel is many-sided, has many aspects, many divisions of truth. That's not surprising. But I do suggest that it is indeed a very surprising thing that in 1963 men and women should still be all wrong about what the gospel is wrong about its foundation, wrong about its central message, wrong about its objective, 
wrong about the way in which one comes into relationship with it. And yet I suggest to you that that is the very position by which we are confronted at the present time. Now, I'm in a sense not blaming the modern men and women, those who are outside the Christian church. There is a sense in which I don't blame them for their bewilderment and for the fact that they're outside the church. Because unless we are living in days and times when the church herself is mainly responsible for the confusion. And that is why I say that there is nothing which is more urgently important than at any rate we should be clear about our approach to this gospel. Because if our initial approach is wrong, everything must be wrong. That's obvious, isn't it? If you are setting out upon a journey, if you want to go to a given place, if you set out upon the wrong road, you will not arrive at your destination. The time to be extremely careful is at the beginning, the first step. Now, I'm suggesting that the main trouble today, as I see it with so many people who are quite honest and sincere, and who tell us honestly and sincerely that they're not Christians, their main trouble, I want to suggest tonight, is that their whole notion of Christianity is wrong. And that therefore they must be wrong over all the details as they are. Now, let me try to crystallize this by giving you a, a typical modern example or statement of this very thing to which I'm referring. A book has recently been published with the title Soundings, Soundings. And it's been written by a number of scholars in Cambridge. Now, let me just read a few words to you out of a review on this book which bears the title of Soundings. This is the reviewer writing. First of all, he quotes a sentence from the book. It is a time for making soundings, not charts and maps. That's one of the writers, that's the editor of the book. He says it isn't a time for making charts or maps. It's a time for taking soundings. Then the reviewer goes on. He says, if this suggests that the authors are all at sea, fair enough. So are we all or should be. Don't quite know what he means there, but that's how he puts it. He says, fair enough, so are we all, or should be. I think what he really means to be fair to him is that we all should be somewhere on this uncharted ocean, that we shouldn't be on the shore, we should be on the sea. I don't think he means us to take at sea in the way that you've taken it and in the way that I myself first took it uh, when I read uh, the sentence. All right. But then he goes on and this is what he says. The church has no earthly chance of survival in the nuclear age if it thinks that the depths of the knowledge of God's truth are all known and can be plumbed by anyone who sits at the end of the pier with a string of texts in his hand. Now that's the crucial statement. The church has no earthly chance of survival in this nuclear age if it thinks that the depths of the knowledge of God's truth are all known, known already and can be plumbed by anyone who sits at the end of the pier with a string of text in his hand. Then he goes on. It is to be hoped that many others will have the faith and courage to launch out into the deep with the authors of this book to pilot them. Now then, there I think is a very typical and representative statement of this modern position. What's it mean? Well, let me put it in other language. This is what, there's, what he's saying. Now he says we must start from this point, that you and I are living in the atomic age. That's the basic thing. We are, are living in 1963, not 1863, not 1763, not 1663, not AD 63. We are living in the atomic age. Very well. That's changed everything. 
what may have been true in the past is no longer true. And if the church is to survive in this atomic age, then you've got to give up this notion that truth is already known, that all the depths are already familiar to men. You've got to realize that you're out in the midst of an ocean. You've got no map, you've got no chart. You don't know where you are. The only thing you can do is to take soundings. Get some notion of the depth beneath you, where you are. Are you near land or are you not? Take soundings. No, cha no chart, no map. It's a time for taking soundings. In other words, the whole position can be represented like this. That because of all these scientific discoveries and the advance of knowledge, particularly scientific, everything is once more in the melting pot. And all we can do now is to experiment, take soundings, try to make discoveries. Try, if possible, having made your soundings to get some sort of a map or a chart. But it's very difficult. It's no time for that, we are told. No, no, it's no time for making charts and maps, but merely for making soundings, taking these soundings. So here we are. What man can do, and the only thing he can do at this present time in this atomic age is, well, begin to think again, begin to study, begin to read these great philosophers and scientists, and try and get some glimpse of truth at last and hold on to it as best you can. That's the way. And he says he hopes that many will have sufficient courage and faith to launch out into the deep. I don't quite follow this, but listen, let me read it again to you. It is to be hoped that many others will have the faith and courage to launch out into the deep, with the authors of this book to pilot them. How you can pilot without a chart and a map, I don't know. I should have thought that a pilot is a man who knows the place, who knows the channel. I once lived in a town where there was a docks, and I used to notice two lots of men, indoor pilots, outdoor pilots. And when the ship had passed through this lock gates, the outdoor pilot came along. There was a bit of a river to go down before you came to the sea. Why did they need this outdoor pilot? Oh, there was only one answer. He knew the channel. He'd got it in his mind. He knew the map. He'd got a chart. He knew what to avoid. He knew when to keep near to this side, when to keep near to that side. And so with others as they go out to sea, if there are hidden sandbanks and so on. The value of the pilot is that he knows the channel. He's got a map. He's got a chart. And he's an expert in it. But here we are asked to venture out to sea, to be piloted by men who tell us themselves that they haven't got a chart nor a map, but that they are proposing to take some soundings. Now, my friends, that's the position in which so many find themselves this evening. And it is because these words that I've taken as my text tonight seem to me to deal with this position and to answer it that I'm calling your attention to it. We are living certainly in a time of crisis, in a time of confusion. We are living in a world in which the kind of thing I've just been announcing as having happened last Friday night can happen to any one of us at any moment. You see, if we could be sure and certain that we'd got 50 years to live, well, then you might say, well, there's no need to be in a hurry about this. It's very exciting, very thrilling. Let's follow the investigations. Let's take the soundings. But my dear friend, you and I may come to the end of the journey at any moment. Is there nothing that can be given us? Is there no chart and compass? Is there no knowledge? Is there no pilot who can step on board and give me an assurance that I'm going to arrive in the everlasting haven of God? That's what I want. Isn't that what you want? I take it you're here because you want that. Thank God there is a positive answer. I'm here and I'm standing in this pulpit because I'm not making soundings. I've got a chart. I've got a map. And I want to tell you something about it as simply and as plainly as I can. Now then, look how all this is dealt with here, I say, uh, so plainly and so clearly. No, I'm, I'm simply going to pick out the words that are in the text. After that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching 
preaching. Now, there is the key at once. What's it mean? Well, the word that is translated preaching here is a very interesting word. It is a word that was not confined to Christianity or to the Christian church at all. It was a word that was very common in the Roman Empire at the time when these things were first written and when they first happened. It was a word that was used in particular in connection with the cult that had arisen of the emperor worship. You realize that they used to worship those Roman emperors. They didn't always do that, but they reached a point when they began to worship. Don't laugh at them because we've seen something very similar in this century. That was what happened with Hitler in Germany, and it's happened in other ways in other countries. Men's always ready to worship men. Let's be careful. Let's be careful in our judgments. Emperor worship. Now then, the word preaching came in in this way. When a son and heir was born to the emperor, a proclamation was made. A great announcement was made. And the word that was used for that very process was the word translated preaching. It's an announcement, a proclamation. It happened when the heir was born. It happened when he came of age. It happened at his accession to the throne or to the imperial power. So what we are told is this, that when John was put into prison, Jesus came into Galilee announcing, proclaiming, heralding. It was the peculiar work of the herald to do this very thing. Now, the word is interesting, therefore, because it conveys this notion of idea at once, doesn't it? A herald doesn't uh, make an uncertain announcement. A herald doesn't get up and blow his trumpet and say, listen, we don't quite know what's happening or what might happen or what's going to take place, but, uh, well, we only hope that something is going to happen. That's not heralding. No, no, the herald had a definite, specific message. That's why he gets up and blows his trumpet. Listen, he says, I've got something to tell you. He's got an announcement to make. That's the term that is used here about what our Lord did. It's the term that's used about what the apostles did afterwards. It is the word that has been used about preaching in the Christian church ever since. So, you see, we start with a note of certainty. Authority. Issued from the imperial palace. That was the first word uttered. Not a man getting up and saying, well, my opinion is, you know, that before long there will be an announcement. No, no. He stood up and had a bit of paper in his hand and he said, issued by the imperial palace at such and such a time, we have the honor to inform you. That's it. Preaching. It carries, the very word carries within it the whole notion of authority, of certainty, an absolute unequivocal statement. You see, this is the very opposite, isn't it, of inviting people to a quest or to a search. This has always been popular, this notion that uh, a Christian is a man who is seeking and searching after truth. That he's a man who sets out in a journey, this vast and explored expanse of truth. A Christian, what is he? Well, he's a man who doesn't just spend his time eating and drinking and indulging his passions. He's an intellectual man, and he sets out in the quest, the search for truth. Oh, and it's thrilling, it's wonderful. The uncharted oceans, the promised land, the unknown. And off you set with this thrill and excitement of the quest for truth. It's been very popular always. Man likes that kind of thing. It appeals to his spirit of adventure. And there have been men who haven't hesitated to say this. Their criticism of our evangelical gospel has always been that it's too certain and too dogmatic. You see, the poets like saying this sort of thing, don't they? That's the poets of all men have generally fooled themselves more than others. It is better to travel hopefully than to arrive... Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Better to travel, hopefully, than to arrive. In other words, you people in this chapel are to be pitied. You set out to come to Westminster Chapel and you've arrived. The pity is that you're not going round and round on the inner circle. 
better to travel hopefully than to arrive. That's it, you see, the quest for truth, the excitement of the chase, the thrill of the investigation. How boring when you arrive. How disappointing when you rarely discover. You see, they're not interested in truth at all. They're interested in themselves as seekers and searchers after the truth. Thus they fool themselves. But life isn't a game. Life isn't a play. Life isn't play acting. Oh, life is serious and solemn. Life is real. Life is earnest. And that's the sort of life and world that we find ourselves in tonight. So I say at the beginning, thank God that as I look at this, I'm not invited to some great experiment or to some great search or quest or journey of exploration. In the midst of my failure in life and my many failures, with my heart breaking and my soul bleeding, and as I'm almost giving up in despair, I suddenly hear a bugle call or a trumpet sounding, and I say, what's this? Thank God I hear an authoritative proclamation. I hear a man saying, listen, I'm a herald. I've got a message from the imperial palace. I announce to you, preaching. Very well, that's the beginning of the gospel, you see. Now, let me translate that into simpler, more ordinary language. I'm here to tell you, my friends, that the answer to all your questions is in this one book, the Bible. If I'm a herald, and I am, thank God, unworthy though I am, I'm a herald. I'm not here to tell you my theories and my ideas about life tonight. They're no better than yours. I'm here because I've been given a message from the imperial palace. And here it is. And I'm here to tell you with authority, with the authority of God, that all your questions have already been answered and all your problems have already been solved. You have but to listen to this preaching, this proclamation and you'll find peace and rest for your souls. And if you should be asked to pass from time to eternity tonight, you'll know where you're going. You'll, be not, you'll not be alone. You'll be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I know him whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. Thank God we've got preaching, proclamation. Authoritative pronouncement. Very well, there's our first word. Let's go on to the second thing which we notice. The second thing I notice about this gospel and about this Christian preaching is this. That it announces a plan and a purpose. Where do you find that, sir? Someone will let me tell you. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. What's he mean by that? Well, what he means, you see, is this. The time that has been spoken of has come to pass. It's fulfilled. But what's this about time? Well, here is the great message of the Bible, if you like, from beginning to end. The message of the Bible is simply this. That God has got a plan and a purpose for this world of sin and of shame. That is really the one big message of the Bible. Here we are, I say, in our failure, in our unhappiness, in our utter confusion. We've tried, we've striven, we've done our best, but it comes to nothing. The world gets worse and worse, and we get worse and worse. And we get more and more hopeless and more filled with despair. We are baffled by the immensity of the problems, and all this scientific discovery makes it worse rather than better. And here we are in utter hopelessness. We've tried to read the philosophers, but they don't know any more than we do. They can speculate, they can make their dogmatic assertions, but we find they're disproved, they're always being changed. What do we do? Where can we go? Is there any hope of deliverance? Is there any possible way out? Here comes the message. There is. God 
has got a plan and a purpose for this world. And it is a plan to deliver men and women such as ourselves out of the morass into which we've fallen. To give us, if you like, in the midst of this uncharted ocean, a map, a chart, a compass, a direction, a pilot, everything we need. God himself has planned it. Now, all that is implicit in this phrase, the time is fulfilled. The time of God's plan coming, as it were, into operation has actually arrived. That's the meaning of the word, the time is fulfilled. Now, the Bible, you see, puts it like this. That God had made this plan even before the foundation of the world itself. You remember how the Apostle Paul puts that in preaching to the church to the people at Corinth when he first went amongst them. He puts it like this in 1 Corinthians 2, 7. He says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. There it is. Now this is the essence of this proclamation that is being made. This is the essence of Christian preaching. He doesn't say to us, well now, there is truth, that uncharted ocean, get out onto it, take your soundings, try and get your bearings, try and find out, put it down if you can. Yes, you've discovered a little bit, you may go for weeks and find nothing, months, years pass, then just another little dimmer, at long, oh no, it won't happen in your time, it'll happen perhaps, well, your grandchildren, oh, perhaps even longer, but go on, it's marvelous, keep on, keep on searching, you'll find you've been wrong as your forefathers were, but go on searching, see, no, no, it's the exact opposite of that. The message of this book is not to urge us to try and find truth. It is to ask us to listen to the truth, to God's truth. For its whole point is to say that God, knowing himself, knowing man, knowing everything, has devised and schemed a plan whereby man can be delivered out of his failure and sin and can be made a citizen and a worthy citizen of God's kingdom. God's plan. It not only tells us that God has a plan and that he planned it before the foundation of the world, it tells us that God has made this plan known. He's made it known. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us in his Son. That's it, same thing. You see, your Old Testament is nothing but God revealing his plan and his purpose. He did it in that extraordinary way. He took a man called Abram and turned him into a nation. And then he spoke to that nation. He gave them his word, which they collected. They called them the oracles of God. We call them the Old Testament now. He took a man called Moses and he gave him a revelation of how he'd created the world and men, how sin had come in and what had happened, and how then he had this great plan and purpose which he worked out. God has revealed it all. And the message of the Bible is just to tell us about this plan and purpose of God, which he has revealed in that way through the instrumentality of men, in order that we may know what we've got to do and find salvation through doing it. Well, then the next thing that follows, you see, is this. That this is something that God has already done. And because God has already done it, I needn't waste a second in trying to discover truth. All I need do is to pay attention to the truth that God has already revealed through the prophets, through the teachers of the Old Testament, through his Son, through the apostles of the New Testament. It's all here. I don't need anything fresh or new. All I need has already been given. And, of course, that is why preaching is possible. If it were anything tonight, it wouldn't be preaching. It would be a sort of philosophical society. 
or a semi-political ethical society, and I'd be here saying, well, now we see the mess we're in, what can we do? And I'd put theories and ideas before you. I'd say, go home and consider that. What do you think about it? Shall we try it? Shall we see how we get on with it? That's all right. But you see, it's got nothing to do with this. Here is a proclamation which comes and says, Thus saith the Lord, this is my way, this is my plan. You believe this and you'll find it's true. That's the message. God's plan. Nothing matters but this. And you see, of course, in the light of that, that all this talk about atomic age is just stuff and nonsense. Atomic age. Got nothing to do with it. Why, well, because God is still what he was 2,000 years ago. God doesn't change. The splitting of the atom doesn't make the slightest difference to God. God's character is what he's always revealed it to be. He revealed it back through Moses in the Ten Commandments. He is a holy God. He is a hater of sin. He's one who's going to punish sin. God hasn't changed. Not at all. He never will change. He is the father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Oh, I'll go further. God cannot change. It's impossible. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is the eternal, absolute God. The all and in all. I am everlastingly. I am what I am. But at the same time, it is equally true to say that man doesn't change. The church has no hope in this atomic age. Why not? Well, they say, because man is now different. Man knows things that he didn't know a hundred years ago. Does he? All right, of course. He knows that he can split the atom. Even I, when I did some science, was taught that there was nothing smaller than the atom, that the atom is indivisible. That's wrong, of course, now. We were told it then with great dogmatism. But by now, that's wrong. And probably what they're saying now will be wrong in a hundred years or so. I don't know. It doesn't matter. All I'm concerned to say is this. What has all that got to do with me? Is man as men any different? Is man different morally? Has man given up drinking because he split the atom? Has man giving up, given up immorality because he can send a man up into outer space? Has man ceased to have lusts and passions and evil desires within him because of all these tremendous advances? <coughs> and you know the answer. They don't make the slightest difference. They're complete irrelevances. The problem of men tonight is what the problem of men has always been. Man's problem has been this from the beginning. There were two brothers, one called Cain, one called Abel. And Cain was jealous of Abel and murdered him. Man still like that. Read your Old Testament and about the characters in the Old Testament. You'll find them. There they are, drunkards, adulterers, thieves, robbers, jealousy, envy, malice, spite, greed, avarice. It's all still with us. These are the problems of life. The atom's got nothing to do with it. It's man. Man is a moral being. Man is a spiritual being. And all these things don't touch it. There's our problem. And so, you see, we must get rid of this notion that because we are in the atomic age, we need something new. We don't. You notice how this man puts it. He says, you get rid of this notion that you can sit at the end of the pier with a string of texts in your hands. Don't you believe, he says, that ultimate truth is already known? He says, this is the thing that is monstrous. The church has no earthly chance of survival in the nuclear age if it thinks that the depths of the knowledge of God's truth are all known. And I'm here tonight to tell you that they are all known. They've all been revealed by God himself. If the knowledge of God were dependent upon man and man seeking and searching, obviously one generation would have an advantage over the previous one. But as we happen to be in this position in which man by searching cannot find God at any age or at any time, 
We are entirely dependent upon the revelation of God. And as God has already given his revelation, the people to whom it first came know as much as you and I know, and nobody will ever know more than them. Now, this is to me absolutely crucial and basic. You see, according to that other argument, You and I, because we are living in the 20th century, should know more about God than the Apostle Paul did. We should know more about the Lord Jesus Christ than the Apostles did. Why? Well, because we are in the 20th century, in the atomic age. And look at the great aggregate of knowledge that we've obtained since. But you see, according to this, it makes not the slightest difference. None at all. The Christian church is built upon the foundation of the Apostles and Prophets. Why? Oh, I can tell you why. God chose these men, these apostles and prophets, to give them the revelation, to give them the knowledge that man needs. They were special people. In the old dispensation, he had these men whom he called prophets. He picked them, he chose them. And when he'd taken a man, he gave him the message, and then he guided him and inspired him by the Spirit in the careful, accurate writing and recording of it. God did it all, and the man... He wasn't a passive amanuensis. No, no, his personality comes in. But the message and the truth of it is entirely from God, not the man. The same with the apostles and prophets. And if the world lasts another billion years, man will never know more about God or about Christ or about heaven and about hell and about salvation than he can know now if he reads this book with spiritual eyes. We are in no more advantageous position than the people of the first century. Who would like to say that any modern man knows Christ as well as Paul knew him? What arrogance it is, yeah, what nonsense it is. This is not a matter of knowledge aggregating and adding to itself. This is receiving the revelation that God gives. And he has given it once and forever. Very well, what is it? Let me hurry on. The thing that we are told next, therefore, is this, that this plan of God is carried out by God acting in history. This is again a vital point. Christianity is not primarily a teaching. It is a recorded history. Christianity is not urging men to think and to try to delve into the mystery and discover truth about God. It says, listen, this is what God has done. Isn't that what happened on the day of Pentecost at Jerusalem in Peter's first sermon? Isn't that what the people said about the apostles when they began to speak with tongues? What is this, they said? We do hear all these people speaking in our own tongues. What? The wonderful works of God. Not the thoughts of God, but the works of God. The things that God has done. And you see, that is the message of Christianity. Do you know what it is? Listen, here it is. Now, after that John the Baptist was put into prison. That's a fact of history. That's an event in history in time. As Julius Caesar conquered this country in 55 or 54 BC, whichever it was, so at a given point in time... John the Baptist was thrown into prison. And at that moment, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. Listen to me, he said. It's happened. It's come. It's arrived. Now, what does this mean? It means this. That your salvation and mine, my dear friend, depends not upon our thoughts, not upon our understanding, not upon our discovery of truth. It depends entirely and utterly upon something that has literally happened in this world 1963 years ago. So we preach to this atomic age and this is what we say. Don't come and, not come and join us in the uncharted ocean and help us to take soundings in order that we may arrive ultimate. It says, look back, look back, go back to 2,000 years, first century. Listen, when John was thrown into prison, Jesus came and said, it's happened, it's arrived, the time is fulfilled, that's it. In other words, let me put it in this form. Your salvation and mine depends not upon our understanding, 
but upon what God has done in Christ. Thank God for this. You and I are not all of us philosophers and we haven't got great brains and understandings. But when I'm told a fact, I can believe it. There's a man standing and saying, I've come from the imperial palace. A son and heir has been born to the emperor. I'm no philosopher, but I can understand that. Good, I say. Wonderful. I'd like to see that child. Very well, here comes a proclamation and says, When the fullness of the times was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. And it means your salvation if you, and if you accept it and give yourself to it. It's a unique event. There is a further reason for you never to talk again about this atomic age. The atomic age makes no difference. No age makes any difference at all. The turning point of history was 2,000 years ago. There is the end of an age, the beginning of a new age. Here is the turning point of all time, the crucial event, the unique event, God's event, God acting. Here it is, when John, Jesus came, history. Very well, I say, let's get rid of this talk about atomic age. The only age that matters is that point. The new age, the new dispensation, God's time. Very well, my dear friend, the preaching of the gospel comes to you tonight. And it doesn't invite you to a quest or to a search or to an endeavor or to some wonderful thrill of hoping to find. It says, just as you are, look back. God has already done all that is necessary for your every need and your salvation. What is it? Well, let me just give it to you in a few words. It's called here a gospel. He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now that's not a good translation there. I'll give you a better one. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has drawn near. He doesn't mean it's about to come. He says it has come. It has drawn near or it has come near. Not at hand. It's come near. Indeed, it's arrived amongst you. What does he mean? Well, what our Lord was saying was this. God, he says, you know, has been promising throughout the centuries that he was going to do something crucial. Read your Old Testament, he says, in effect. Remember what God said away back in the Garden of Eden? He said, it's all right, you've sinned and you're going to be punished. But the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. That's it. It's going to come. And on through your Old Testament, this promise is repeated. It's increased. It's coming. And they were all looking forward. And the prophets, look at Isaiah 40 that I read to you. Comfort ye, comfort ye your people, my people, saith your God. He said it eight centuries before Christ was born. But what he was saying was this. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. You don't see it now, he said. Comfort, prepare. Every valley shall be exalted and every hill shall be brought low. Remove the stones. Prepare a highway. Be ready. He's coming. This Messiah, this Deliverer, he's coming. And all the prophets said the same. And the people were waiting and longing. A Messiah, a Deliverer, is going to come. And our Lord suddenly appeared and began to preach. And he said, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God has come. What God has promised throughout the centuries, he has now fulfilled. He says, this is good news. This is gospel. Why? Well, because it is an announcement of the coming of the kingdom of God. He preached the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Well, you see, the kingdom of God means the reign of God. The world is as it is because it's rebelled against God. And man is in his present trouble and distress because he's a rebel. And because he's reaping the fruits of his own evil deeds and God is pouring his punishment down upon him. Take it from me, my friend, the way of the transgressor is hard. 
There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And your clever modern man in the atomic age is in trouble. And as long as he turns his back upon God, his trouble will increase. Let him be as clever as he likes. It doesn't matter. The way of the transgressor is hard. But the kingdom of God is the very antithesis of that. It's the rule of God. It's the reign of God. It means the coming of righteousness. It means the coming of peace. It means that evil is controlled and defeated. It means that God's blessings are showered upon us. It means that we bask in the sunshine of God's favor. It means that we become heirs of God and with the hope of everlasting bliss. That's what it is. Did you notice that last hymn we sang? It put it very well. The race, hark the glad sound, the Savior comes, the Savior promised long. This is preaching. Let every heart prepare a throne and every voice a song. Why? Well, he comes, the prisoners to release, in Satan's bondage held. The gates of brass before him burst, the iron fetters yield. Man's a slave of sin. He's in misery and bondage and unhappiness. And he can't break free. Here comes one who can break the bars of iron and the gates of brass in sunder. He can set the prisoner free. He comes from thickest films of vice to clear the mental ray and on the eyeballs of the blind to pour celestial day. He comes the broken heart to bind, the bleeding soul to cure, and with the treasures of his grace to enrich the humble poor. That's what's meant by the kingdom of God. You remember our Lord back in his hometown of Nazareth? He went as was his custom on the Sabbath into the synagogue and they handed the book unto him and he began to read and this is what he read. He read from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Not the philosophers, not the great men of the atomic age, the poor of all ages. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him, and he began to say unto them, Listen, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He says the kingdom of God has arrived. God's favor has come. The day of release, the day of pardon, the day of renewal, the day of new life, the day of rejoicing in God and his government instead of rebelling against him. It's come, the day of the favor of the Almighty, the day of the grace of God. It's come. It's drawn near. It's arrived. Good news. Oh, yes, and especially when you consider how it's arrived. And it's arrived, you see, in this person, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is the same as the gospel of the kingdom of God. Yes, it is in the coming of this person that the kingdom of God has come. God has been saying throughout the centuries, I'm going to send a deliverer. He's arrived. Where has he arrived? In the stable in Bethlehem. There he is, the little babe in the manger. He is the one who is the king. The kingdom comes with the king. He's arrived, and here he is preaching. Who is he? Son of God, the beginning of the gospel of Christ, the Son of God. Oh, my dear friend, this is the gospel. You and I are not left, you see, to try and to delve into the mystery of the being and the person of God and to try to discover a way out of our predicament. No, no, the message is this. God hath visited and redeemed his people. God hath sent forth his own Son. 
made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that are under the law. God so loved the world, this world, this damned, foolish, evil, foul world that you and I live in and of which we are all a part by nature. God so loved it that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. My dear friend, forget about the atomic age. Look back, look at the babe in the manger. There he is, God in the flesh, God's deliverer. God come down to deliver you, to rescue you. He does so in his person. He does so in his teaching. He does so in his work. Mark goes on to tell us all about it in his gospel. And he does it supremely by dying upon a cross on a hill called Calvary. That's the crucial act. Because you and I, as we are, cannot enter the kingdom of God. We are rebels. We are sinful. We are guilty. We are vile. You can't live in God's kingdom unless you're a worthy citizen. How can I enter? Here's the answer. This is the good news. That he bore my sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. Here's the message. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And thereby dying on the cross, he's opened the gateway into the kingdom. And he says, today is the day of salvation. Enter in. Come unto me. All ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The time is fulfilled. The time promised so long has arrived. The kingdom of God has drawn near, has come near. He says, I am it. I am the king. Come unto me. Just as you are, thank God. You don't have to put yourself right first. You don't have to understand the profundities first. You don't have to set out in some great quest. You may have to die before midnight tonight. And your question is, how can I stand before God? How can I know that I'm going to heaven and eternal bliss? And this is the answer. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom has come. The king is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he loved you so much that he died for you and your sins. And all he says to you is repent, think again, believe my message. Repent and believe the gospel. Acknowledge your folly, acknowledge your sin, acknowledge your shame, acknowledge your helplessness. Stop making inquiries. Stop setting out with your great intellect to understand. Say, I cannot, I failed. God is God and I man finite sinful. I cannot I believe that thou art the Son of God and the Savior of my soul. That's all. Simply believe. Only believe. And thou shalt see that Christ is all in all to thee. My dear friend, don't be a fool. You don't understand life. You don't understand death. You don't understand yourself. You know nothing about tomorrow. How can you understand God? Give up, give in. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. As the Philippian jailer was saved by believing it. As men have been saved by believing it throughout the centuries ever since. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Believe that this is God's plan, that he sends his only begotten Son into the world to redeem us because he alone could do it, because he alone was big enough and strong enough and mighty enough to take our sins and bear the punishment. Nevertheless, come out the other side and arise and take his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Is that good news to you? That's the test, you see. Is this good news to you? Are you thrilled by it? Do you really want to sing about it? 
Do you want to crown him with many crowns? The lamb upon his throne? Hark how the hymn, the anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king throughout eternity. Do you want to do that? If you don't, it means that you are so blinded by sin and by Satan that you don't know that you're a lost soul, that you don't know that if you die like that, you go to hell, to everlasting misery. But if you've ever seen your need and failure, if you're afraid to die and to face God as any man in his senses must be, well, then you say this is the most wonderful news I've ever heard, that God, sent his own son to reconcile me unto himself. And in my utter helplessness and hopelessness, all I do is to cast my sins on him, cast myself on him, cling to him just as I am. There's nothing like it in heaven or in earth. It's the most glorious good news that has ever come. That, and that alone, is the message of the Christian gospel. Repent if you've never done before and believe the gospel and be safe. You will be safe. Whether you die tonight or not will be an irrelevance. Nothing matters. You'll be right, reconciled to God with your eternal future. Absolutely safe. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.